All right, good evening. Uh, we're here tonight to have a work session, Planning Commission, on um, it's the second work session which we have held in the review of the comprehensive plan. Tonight, the focus will be on the housing section, uh, and we have, um, I think Dannon is going to give our presentation tonight mm -hmm. on this, and uh, we will see what we can do. Our draft goals, I guess, are to update existing language tables and data, remove redundant, outdated, contradictory, or unnecessary information, remove unnecessary illustrations or maps, and update goals, objectives, and strategies in concert with the Planning Commission in consultation with city departments, boards, and commissions. Do, do your presentation. Sure, I can. Uh, um, so there is a draft before you tonight of Chapter 3, and I'll just go through some of these slides. Um, I guess I'll go through the presentation in order from this podium here, uh, just to make it easier for the people actually running the show. So I'll start with the first slide. Um, so this is our September 7th work session, and we are working on comprehensive plan draft of Chapter 3, which is housing. So um, this is just a review of the work schedule. We are at September 7th with housing. Our next chapter will be September 21st on economics and the draft goals, as Ms. Shriver just said. So changes for Chapter 3 were a bit more substantial than the changes for the previous chapter, which was the demographics chapter. Um, it began with removing several figures and tables and trying to incorporate their information with the text. So the tables of the older chapter on housing type with the number of units, um, the housing tenure chart and the housing tenure table and the housing type comparison table, those charts and tables were removed from this draft and incorporated back into the actual language of the text. All of the other tables or charts have been kept for the new draft and they have been updated to the most recent data using either Weldon Cooper Center or American Community Survey estimates from 2015. And finally, the housing trends, housing characteristics, and housing estimates and projections sections have been updated to reflect more current data. There has been a significant rearrangement, however, of subsequent sections. Um, the section on existing conditions analysis has been expanded into uh, a section called the current state of Picosan housing which notes uh, the current zoning classifications for the city. It updates a current trend section, including uh, development figures and a list of the new multifamily developments that have come in since the previous comprehensive plan was passed. We've added sections for the Legacy of Pocosin project, as well as a section on residential flood zones. We've moved the citizen comment section here, and we've updated it to reflect the collected comments we received in 2017 and we've removed the key observations section. Um, so as part of this rearrangement, we've deleted the background section, the values of the community subsection, the justification for action subsection, and the affordable housing section. Uh, these sections contained a lot of outdated language, multiple redundant justifications for the previous strategy of housing diversification. And we've moved uh, the current housing issues section to its own independent area. And we've updated issues on the following, to reflect the following. Uh, one is more affordable, preferable low density housing options for low to moderate income families within the community, active lifestyle housing for retirees and empty nesters with limited maintenance, continued efforts, continuing efforts to in accordance with FEMA's CRS system to retrofit, elevate, and flood-proof properties and in to ensure that property maintenance of older housing stock within the city takes place. So those are the four new preliminary housing issues facing Pocosin for this draft. And we've added some language to elaborate on and summarize those issues. From those issues, we have a new key recommendations section uh, with total of seven possible preliminary strategies. First one is strategy one from our existing comprehensive plan. 
Uh, the second is a strategy that was present in older drafts of the current plan but was removed in the final version that was approved by City Council. Strategies three through five are based on staff discussion and citizen comments. They are all new. Strategy six is based on the 1999 comp plan and strategy seven was based on discussions with the city floodplain manager. And I've rewritten the conclusion and recommendations for study and summary sections to reflect these recommendations and the rest of the chapter. So I'll go through these proposed strategies in detail. Uh, the first strategy is to allow compatible types of single family attached residential dwellings in future planned subdivisions that also contain single family detached residential dwellings. So this is currently in our comprehensive plan. It's a strategy saying that whenever new subdivisions are built, we should allow uh, a certain percentage of the properties to be developed as duplexes, uh, as single family attached dwellings. And that would create a uh, cheaper, slightly higher density housing product that would be slightly more affordable to residents. Strategy two is to create a moderate density land use district that permits single family attached residential dwellings compatible to the single family detached landscape of Pocosin. So this was to try and create a strategy that was proposed in the previous comprehensive plan update process to kind of create a middle ground between the large lot single family residential districts and the multifamily residential district. Something with a density between three to nine units per acre, something like that. That would accommodate smaller homes, starter homes, maybe townhomes or other types of slightly higher density and more affordable housing products. Strategy three is to create a low density land use district that permits smaller lots and single family attached residential dwellings. Um, this is basically a variation on strategy two that's leaning towards more single family small starter homes. Proposed strategy four is to modify the regulations around accessory structures to allow less restrictive accessory apartments, specifically for multi-generational housing. Now, the city already has a policy allowing accessory dwellings uh, from a primary structure, usually for the purposes of providing housing for an elderly family member. Um, this strategy proposes to try and codify that and make it a little more official and make it a little more accommodating maybe by relaxing certain restrictions on utilities or um, uh, appliances that you can have in the accessory building to try and promote that as a housing strategy. Strategy five is the promotion of higher density multifamily housing in Bicosan, albeit slowly and in a planned, publicly transparent fashion. This is simply calling for the addition of more R3 multifamily housing albeit done in a planned way, possibly through the use of a planned unit development um, overlay district like, such as what we used in the legacy of Pocosin. Strategy six is to introduce a home pride program to assist in home maintenance and renovation in the city. One of the takeaways for the um, housing data that's in the draft chapter is that the city's housing stock is slowly getting older. It is in good condition, but Property maintenance is always a concern. Um, this was touched on in the old 1999 plan. We've since adopted a housing maintenance code and done a number of things, but we could do more to kind of promote this, provide more funds to make more funds available to try and promote housing maintenance within the city on older properties. And strategy seven, uh, continue efforts to improve Bacosin's FEMA CRS rating, lowering local flood insurance premiums and minimizing safety hazards and property damage from flooding. So this is just a continuation of the strategies that we've been doing uh, within the past several years to try and get our CRS rating up, get our flood insurance premiums down and promote floodplain management and floodplain awareness in the city. So those are the proposed strategies. I will state again that these are all extremely pre preliminary um, and I would ask you to discuss amongst yourselves and let me know uh, do you feel they are appropriate, how they can be improved or changed, and how do the goals, objectives, and strategies section needs to be altered to, in order to reflect them. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. That you have. Right, thank you, Dan. <clears throat> Oh.
All right, we have a full crew tonight, so we ought to have some good discussion. Um, so, do we want to start with uh, we've, already, we've identified the things here that seem to be the issues and the recommendations, I guess, would be all about what Dannon has presented. Anybody has any discussion on it, please jump in. Chairwoman, I'd like to ask Dan in a question about strategy three uh, with the uh, lower density land use district that would allow smaller lots and smaller residences. Would there also be a provision uh, for more green space uh, among the, uh, uh, I guess, among the houses? Would there be kind of more of a cluster zoning or uh, that type of thing where you might have smaller lot sizes, but then within the neighborhood, you would have more green space uh, required. Uh, yes, that could certainly be included. <clears throat> I, I have a fundamental question, and uh, forgive me, I should have emailed first. <laughs> um, in the last comp plan, it indicated that, uh, that the, the amount of vacant land that we had that was buildable was less than 20%, and that's in the old plan. If you include the legacy project, which is going to be taking place over 15 years, how much potentially vacant buildable land would you estimate might, we might be talking about? Maybe Debbie might be, <laughs> be able to get a... Well, the legacy is going to encompass acres of land. Um, so percentage-wise, I mean, I don't know exactly which provision that you were reading from in the comp. Um, but it's a small percentage, 100 acres. Something we could look at and get back with you on. Yeah, and I should, I, forgive me, I should have asked earlier, um, because we're, we are facing, I guess, a potential build-out situation. So my question is, um, we can have all the strategies in the world, but if we don't have that much potential land to be worked with, where does that leave us? Well, one of the more important issues that we're going to be facing in the next 40 to 50 years or within, let's say, with even within the life of this comp plan, is going to be redevelopment. Some of the older areas could be redeveloped. So, when you're thinking about the vision for the future, not only consider the raw land that is left to be developed. How could we redevelop in a in a productive way? One of the things I'd like to point out, too, in speaking to Commissioner Emmett's comments is that we currently have an open space development in the zoning ordinance, um, which is very commonly used, and it requires or it allows for a smaller lot in exchange for 50% of open space. Um, one of the items that I that the ordinance may be weak on is the fact that there's not a lot of um, requirement as to recreational facilities being provided within that open space. It mentions it, but it's not really a mandatory or there's a percentage that's given as to, um, you know, so much of the open space has to be preserved for walking trails, playgrounds, and or pools, or, or any type of common activity use. Um, so therefore, I would suggest that we concentrate maybe on looking at those provisions and seeing if we would like to, to put some restrictions on the type of activities that would be allowed in those smaller subdivisions. With the understanding that we now require sidewalks in all of our new developments. 
So walking trails may be a secondary type of activity, recreational areas. General question, and I'm not even sure who it's for, but this combines a couple of traits. Um, kind of exemplify myself. One is, I haven't been here lately, so I need a little education. And number two, my job has me involved with hurricanes. And so I'm looking at number seven here about the Picosin uh, FEMA ratings. And um, I'm wondering, um, for those who don't know a lot about this, I mean, I think any citizen of Picosin, and I, maybe I don't even, maybe you're going to have to educate me on this, but if they can save money or find any way to, to raise their homes or do whatever these things can be done to get this lower rating, maybe even like a general education program. I mean, I think this is, this is somewhat mysterious to me, and maybe because I haven't been doing my homework and not reading, but I'm wondering what other citizens of Picosin may be able to, you know, to benefit if, in fact, they're pondering doing things to help make their house more waterproof or something. <laughs> so I don't know who could answer that. As I said, I think it's more of a function of maybe me not being educated than anything else. But I'm curious about, like, a did you know type thing where, did you know if you dig a ditch in front of your house and let the water run through better, this will happen, get a lower rating. It might be bad, not a bad thing, because I don't, I know, I know, what, I mean, I don't know what this is, and I'm on the planning commission. So I'm thinking, can we educate the Picosan citizens in any way, shape, or form to have them take advantage of that? I think that's a great idea. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, Anna. that's all right. Um, this strategy came out of discussions with Ken Somerset, our building official. Uh, he is also the floodplain manager from the city, um, and he has been pretty much the driving force behind flood insurance and floodplain education uh, within the past few years. Um, he's done a lot of work with the FEMA's CRS program. We have very good compliance with it. We've got a pretty good rating for the locality that we are. Um, I can tell you personally that pretty much every month uh, Ken sends me a spreadsheet detailing the people he's talked to about flood insurance, home raising, flood and, um, flooding, and where my house is in the flood zone. I'd say he talks to at least 10 to 20 people a month, Great. 10 to 20 homeowners about this situation. So it's an ongoing process and a lot of progress has been made. Uh, this suggestion is just to kind of build on that and maybe try and make that program, as you said, more aware um, and spread it out to try and get as many people as possible aware of the realities of flooding and flood insurance in Picosan. I just didn't know whether either a web page or maybe the, the public access channels or anything they could just kind of tell people. Uh, to, you know, a little bit more about what they could do to make a difference. Thanks. I have a couple more questions and then I have a uh, little bit more uh, of a discussion about multifamily. But uh, before I do that, just a couple of probably quick questions. The first one being, does this, uh, the housing element, or maybe it's going to be in land use, does it address mobile homes? Or is there any, would that just be more in the land use uh, element of this? Or are mobile homes just, hey, they're the higher density? And we, we've talked a lot about uh, duplexes and, and multifamily housing and, and single uh, family detached housing. And I was wondering if mobile homes are addressed or if any consideration needs to be made for them? Not specifically. Okay. And Just as, as is. Right. As far as I know, okay. the current plan doesn't address them specifically, and I guess it was just out of my mind okay. during this draft. Sure. But if we need to consider it specifically, we could certainly do that. And then uh, another quick question possibly quick. I know that legally, well, I think that legally affordable housing has to be addressed in the comprehensive plan. Is there a requirement, if it's addressed in the comprehensive plan, is there also a requirement that it actually be implemented legally? Or do you just have a strategy to address affordable housing and that meets the legal requirement without necessarily having to have implement, implementation of the strategy? As far as I know, the strategy is the latter. It's essentially just a guidance strategy. As long as it's addressed in the comp plan, that fulfills our requirement of the Virginia State Code. Um, and the definition of affordable housing is somewhat broad in the code, so it gives it a little bit of leeway. 
Then lastly, just a general comment, and then, and then I'll pass this along, is uh, the proposed strategy number five, to promote the construction of higher density multifamily house, uh, housing. I know with uh, the legacy and the fountains, uh, we're proposing adding another 240 units of apartments, which looks like, at least according to this 2015 estimate, that's about a 74% increase. Uh, which is a really big bump. So even with this additional uh, stock that's going to be added, and uh, according to our public survey, only 23% of the um, uh, respondents thought that multi new multi-family homes were a good idea. Do we still want to actively promote the construction of more multi-family housing with the addition of these uh, 240 units that are going to be planned? The answer about the mobile homes um, that they have or have not been discussed? Included. Um, I'll let Dan answer. They have not so far. I don't know if it's mentioned in the land use chapter in any subsequent section, but I don't think there was anything about um, mobile homes in Chapter 3. Interesting. I mean, as a byproduct, eh? a mobile home sometimes, right, or, or seasonal homes or things like that, sometimes have a... Um, I won't say a negative connotation, but you know, some people go, oh, mobile home. On the flip side, you will turn on the TV at night and see tiny homes, and these people are putting homes on little trucks and paying hundreds of thousands of dollars. The question on that one is, I think it's appropriate that we basically make sure we try to include all that, all those different types of homes when we do it, so that we don't kind of cordon ourselves into thinking that the type of home we're talking about has to be. I don't think we think about it a lot, but in other words, let's say people wanted to have their tiny home, going to pay $200,000 for a home on a truck. Um, you should probably, I don't know, I think it's important to just mention that that is a type of housing. Maybe we don't want to touch it, but um, I, I, I said the idea came to me more from watching it at night, watching this on TV, thinking, wow, these things are popular, and the shows are popular, and the people really seem to be into these things, as they downsize or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I don't know what my comment is, other than the fact that a mobile home means more than just, I think, what we traditionally think is a mobile home. Right. To kind of touch on what you said, I find it worth noting that it's kind of a, I guess it's kind of a issue because uh, with, of course, the issue with multifamily has always been, as it says in here, an unpopular idea. But on the other hand, we hear constantly that people are looking for uh, these issues that we have right here, more affordable, preferably low-density housing options for low- to moderate-income families. Now, that's low-density. They want smaller homes on smaller lots, thinking that will be less expensive starter homes. But then you go to active lifestyle housing for retirees and empty nesters with limited maintenance responsibility. That's always been a cry here in the community, which that does not include single family home many times. It's wanting a townhouse or something smaller with lower maintenance for so that you've got you've got this sort of controversy between what people want and what they want. They want one thing, but they want another. And it kind of reminds you of Tevye and Fiddle on the Roof. On the one hand, but then on the other hand. You've got continuing efforts here for, uh, well, you know, to, to try to accommodate many factions in the community, which is a problem. None of us want a bunch of high-density housing, but yet we want to try to maintain housing stock for people that want different things and and what I keep hearing and I hear this over and over I hear a lot of young people that do not want a big house or want even a house they want an apartment and of course with our community we've always hoped to keep growing and you grow 
with, ch with change. If you don't have some change, you, you don't grow. And with us, we've, we've sort of now gotten to the point where we have, I mean, we don't have a lot of children. And that's kind of, to me, that's kind of a, I think it's an issue that I really think about because, you know, we, we really, at one time we had, and, and this was, this coincides with the, with the numbers here that we see. Uh, I would say from 1970 until 1990, we had great growth in this community. Great growth. And that brought in a large influx of students and young people. But now we don't have that. And the baby boom generation had a lot to do with that too, of course. They, the people today are not having as large a families. But, so I don't know, uh, you know, I think we can't, we can't say that we can't look into, you know, I think a little higher density, but not, I mean, you know, I don't think anybody here wants great numbers, but I think to accommodate sometimes the, the needs of, let's say, society or it changes, we've seen a change in that, in the, in what people want for housing. So we kind of have to take that into consideration. I don't know whether we want to promote it, but we might need to think about how best we can meet those needs. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's not easy. I think we've all kind of wrestled with that at times here. You know, we've, it's different things that have come in, such as, uh, you know, the retirement communities that we have. Uh, have one here in the community which has been I think fairly successful but yet I don't think that meets the needs of some young people I mean we we you know the young people I think we we want to try to attract young people to the community it bothers me that we you know that we're kind of not doing that and the superintendent has talked to us about that at numerous points and it closing the school. So I don't know. That's something we do need to discuss. How do we want to? How do we want to look at that? That's an issue. Well, and I think I think that that other strategies help to. They don't. They're not as dense as large apartment complexes. Which, and I, I guess in my mind, I do think of the multifamily uh, apartments being a little bit larger. Whereas the other strategies are more for duplexes, or if you want um, an accessory structure to rent out as an apartment or something like that, um, smaller lot sizes or cottages or some of these tiny homes. Or um, it seems like the other strategies really address things other than the traditional apartment buildings. Uh, and I really like I personally I really like these other strategies. Of, of having some smaller lot sizes and having some other homes that could serve as starter homes or apartments if people have an accessory building. Certainly when you look and see what's popular, in other words, um, and strictly speaking, I guess the place at the end of the road is a trailer park, but to be honest, it's very popular. It's filled up. <laughs> and it's, yeah, I mean, yeah. he's putting more lots in, and that sells you, people are buying them, and there's a demand for them. So we should probably try to meet the demand of anybody. I mean, that, you know, I mean those are folks, lots of times, who maybe want to either downsize or they want to stay in Pocosa. Um, and they don't want a big lot. It's, it's, you know, it's funny. That's why I wanted to be careful we didn't be careful that we don't use words that might have negative connotations like a mobile home. Well, if it's a mobile home, I wouldn't mind living in a mobile home. You know, my point <laughs> is, is that you know, it's a creative, it's a different type of housing. And, and, you know, I think one of the things as a water lover, and this town's got plenty of water, I think it's nice to have an affordable smaller place on the water. I mean, that's almost like an oxymoron on the coast, and most of the waterfront property is millions of dollars. And big, you know, to have, to afford a place where you can quit your kayak in or put your fishing, you know, and walk to a restaurant and do all those things there, that's pretty neat. And you know, we have that ability to do that here. But of course it's up to the people who own the land. I mean, I don't think we should, I don't think should stifle creative ways I don't to have either. small, yeah. No, I don't either. And young professionals who make a good salary, apartment living is sort of a thing that they, they like. I mean, a nice apartment, now I'm not talking, I'm not talking about an inexpensive apartment. There are people who prefer that lifestyle. And 
you know, that that might be, I mean, you know, it's kind of, we have a, like you say, with, with a, a mobile home, we have a certain mindset. With apartments, we have a, a certain mindset. And sometimes it's kind of good to think a little bit out of the box on that. You know, I think you're right on that, Jay. Because it's got we don't a lot want to, to offer, besides just the house itself, that. and right to attract. But we people. have to keep. We do have to keep growing uh, in a in a planned way. We can't. You can't. It's not going. Let's just say in this community, our growth. We we have seen the majority of our growth. We're not going to see an overwhelming. You know, it, it's just not going to be. I think. I think that's something that we can. We know is not going to happen, but yet we don't want to completely stifle, you know, our growth in community. And I, I, I don't know. I, I think we don't want to be too restrictive. I think we, we can, we can look at this carefully and come up with something. I don't know how we want to start it, but can I? Can I? Oh. Okay. Um, you know, try and look at a very broad perspective. If, because this document is really just a very generalized document, okay? It's never going to get specific. It's not going to talk about a trailer park somewhere. Now, I think if you really carefully read strategies two and three, I don't think they do anything at all to discount a trailer park or, for that matter, tiny homes. I, I, mean, I, I think that they're in there. I don't know that they need to be specifically mentioned, but I think that they're in there. And I agree with you in apartments, but as I think Angie mentioned earlier, uh, there are 240 apartments on the planning books now. That's a whole bunch. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, before I went out on limb and said, let's build another apartment building, I'd like to see if they're going to get rented. Especially, I look at fountains, you know, and that's been going on forever and not going on, but nothing's happening. I don't know if that means that they're not able to rent them. I don't have a clue. But, you know, there's a lot on the books. And then on the flip side, you look at the, the place at the end of Rens Road, and those, he's putting more of those park homes in. So there's a demand there, is my point. You know, and so why, if there's a demand at the fountains, you'd think you'd see more going up. Well, okay. I, I just throw my two cents in there. I don't have a problem with the way this is written. In fact, I like the way it's written. It's not throwing open the floodgates to, you know, dozens of apartment complexes. It talks about slow, planned. It would be inappropriate if we had two... Uh, a proliferation of high density. I feel like this is. I, I don't think I don't see why we should close the door for the twenty percent approximately of the land that's uh, not built out yet. That percentage might be. Why would we close the door on any one particular type of housing, be it large mansion, townhome, apartment? This just it it offers up the possibility for it, and that's in a slow planned publicly transparent way and i i don't have um <clears throat> i'd like to add you know in terms of economics some supply and demand is a uh, is a a cost driver um my question in terms of the population and i know we discussed that in the last meeting and i pretty much discounted why do we need to look at these analyses but if we as a planning commission are trying to come up with some sort of ideas for the planned growth of the city, um, are we in agreement that our goal is 100% build out? Um, if we're knocking on the door right now to pretty much not much available land out there, then we go back to that supply and demand. If there's a high demand for our city and there's not much supply, then that's that's going to hold home prices, is it not? Um, so the other question is, are we in agreement that our goal as a planning commission is that we would support a 100% build out of, of Bacosan? The answer has to be uh, as long as the build out preserves the wide variety of people we'd like to see live in the city. In other words, 100% build out at uh, you know, 20, 20 acre plots for 20 mansions. And I don't think I mean, but on the other hand, I don't want to put shackles on it. All I'm getting at is that we want to really try to promote a wide variety of housing, whether it be a baby boomer, 
or a, a person who wants to downsize or whether it be somebody who wants to start a family. All those different groups we'd like to attract to Pocosa because we know the best community is one that's well-rounded. So I think that's an important thing. Build out, yes, but hoping that we can preserve the opportunities for anybody who wants to come here. Now, you're right that we don't want to force people to move here if there's no demand. But, we're, but I think because it has enough other lures into it that I don't see a shortage of people saying, I don't live in Pocosa for any reason. That's my feeling. But in other words, build 100% build out, but make sure that we give everybody an opportunity to live here within means. I actually have heard people say that they don't want to live in Pocosa. Well, for the water and for some, maybe some other. But do you know the reason why? It's because yeah. it's. They say I can buy the same house in York County mm -hmm. and spend $6,000 less. And they're right. Right. So I don't think, again, my two cents, I don't think any community's goal is 100% built out. I think our goal is smartly grow and develop community, right? And part of that includes allowing young families to move in, right? Not not everyone is going to make a six-figure salary. Or it, it, perhaps it shouldn't be that way, I guess I would argue. Um, some of them will be not able to move into these large acre-and-a-half mansions. And I think that those people have an opportunity to come here if they so desire. I always, I think you're exactly right. Uh, I always look at the median income and of course, ours is very high, but it means that there are people below that and there are people above it. That's a median. And that high median income makes it very hard for us to provide that. It makes it difficult. I, I feel it does, always have. I don't mind telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm under that. I tell you that it is a struggle. But of course, having lived here all my life, I, I would like to stay here. Home. And I've heard a lot of people say the same thing, they'd like to stay. Of course, when, when we decide to check out, a lot of the young people used to go into older homes, like I'm in an older home, which I've renovated. But now, a lot of the young people don't even want those older homes. They are sitting. They, they don't want them, and they don't want a big home. So what do they want? What can we attract them with? We want to offer something. We want to offer some op, you know, to, to attract. I think that's one of our goals is to attract and keep young people here in this community because that, that is, you know, that is our life's blood, really. That's, that's what's going to keep Pocosin going. It's what's kept Pocosin going for many years. It almost seems that the only element of people who want to live here, want to live here and can't, are the young folks who are starting out. In other words, a lot of folks who have been here their whole lives. If they want to stay, they can downsize. Or, it seems like the one area that's tough. And so what, it almost seems like here we're saying, we want to keep Pocosin as a choice place to live. We want to make, you know, I mean, if you have to spend an extra dollar or two to live here, that's okay. You don't want to spend an extra, you know, lots of money because you can't afford it. So, on the, um, so we want to, it almost seems like we want to incentivize, incentivize, I don't even know what the right word is there, but I'm close, I think. <laughs> In other words, the people who own land or property to, to develop places that would, they might not make as much money on their property as they might want to make otherwise. But we kind of want to somehow make sure that that still happens because, you know, we all know the future is young folks. But am I wrong in thinking that they're the only people who want to live here and can't? I wouldn't say they can't. I think it's significantly it's more difficult. Right. It's more difficult. Well, I wasn't really thinking of that question. I'm thinking, oh, am I missing other, uh, there are lots of seniors that want to Yes, and they, and they, they are, a lot of seniors have to move from here because they can't stay here. Because they can't afford it or is that because they don't want to take care of the house? Yeah, once you're on a limited income, oh, and you're not working, you're retired. Some people, you know, don't have a lot of income. Due to a number of circumstances. Yeah. Again, I, I certainly agree with you, but I, I, again, I, I'm going back to, I, I think a couple of the strategies that you mentioned in there account for that. Mm -hmm. What it is, what I think the, the issue that we're kind of wrestling with that is not our issue, nothing we can do about it, yeah, is, is 
to find developers who are willing to come in and take some of this property and produce something at a lower cost and put it for sale. The city can't do that unless the city is going to decide to get into the building business, and I certainly hope they do not. I agree. Agreed. <laughs> and Bill, one of the reasons why I just spoke up at all, and I'll admit, I have not read everything yet. I, I'll have to admit, I've been, I apologize. So I. Oh. In fact, everything would be just fine the way it is. I was just in general. No, no, your point is good. Your point is good. I just don't want to, to, to go. To, I, I think it's a point we've, we've heard wrestle with here for many years, and it's a very valid point. I just don't know how, I don't know how, you, how you overcome it. And I, I'd like to see it too, but I, I look around. I live out in the Western District. There's a couple chunks of property out there that are being developed, but they're all going to be developed with big houses. Yeah. At least that's what it looks like at this point in time. And if somebody, you know, I'm not a developer, but if I were in the development business and if I could sell a house for $600,000, why in the world would I build one that I could sell for two and a quarter? And that becomes a difficult part. Mm -hmm. It's difficult, too. Certainly. But I think, I think you're right in saying that what we have here addresses that. I think it does. I, I think, think it's it in does. There. And I, I, think I think that the next God parts the will be thing. when this comp plan updated comp plan gets finalized, then we have to really get into some of the zoning and that sort of thing to perhaps address it. But I don't think we can address the zoning at this particular point in time until we see that the, the comp plan is going to make it through the, the approval process, the review and approval process. But I think that I was, I read this about four times, I'll be honest with you. I, I thought this is really well done. And I do like the fact, although I can find it again, but I know you addressed a couple places in here where we have to be careful about any changes that we make and the effect that they might have on surrounding neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it is identified mm -hmm. here, but I did see it. Yeah. I'll make one more statement. I've liked what I've read too, even though I haven't I'm perused of it. Uh, you're right. It's good. Excellent. Remember we had that question about two years ago. I don't remember the name of the property, but down here on the right-hand side, the end of Wyth Creek, where somebody wanted to put up some things. It was, you know, the neighbors are all R1s, and, and they had a good argument. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. We went and looked at it, and mm -hmm. we turned Still sitting there. Yeah, still sitting there. Mm -hmm. we, we said no, and counsel. Okay. Well, now, I, I think this is a very good job. I want to applaud the, the I do too. Dan and the staff. Dan I'm not sure who did all the work. I think I know. But yeah. uh, I, I really, I, I, I did read it a couple of times. I was, I was, I don't want to say pleasantly surprised because that really sounds like I didn't expect much. <laughs> I, don't mean, I don't mean to come out that way, but it was very nice. Yeah. I thought. And I'd like to add to you, I think, uh, again, I like the majority of these strategies, I think they're very forward thinking. I, I really applaud the work that, that went into this. Yeah, I mean, on number seven, like you were saying, oh, I don't know. The only reason why I've ever found why I'm going to leave the coast is because they don't want to get wet. <laughs> and it looks like we're playing on this with the number seven. So I think that's a great. Right. right. It'll be interesting to see how they go through this process. Sir? I've waited to last because I'm, I'm not going to go in all this happy talk. Uh, Last time we met, we agreed to uh, have a discussion for each of these chapters to lay out what succession will look like for the, each chapter when the chapter is done. I don't, I, I've listened to this success for this housing discussion is. Um, we made assumption in the uh, in the organization of the chapter in its uh, organization that we're going to build more houses. Uh, generally, the strategy and so on, and uh, all of the reasons that have been laid out for doing so, I think are pretty well articulated. problem with the uh, presentation of this, and this goes back to uh, discussion last, at our last meeting when I was made for doing a more wholesale content of the plan, 
and uh, said uh, update was okay, but we agreed as a group to put appropriate content in there. And in that regard, look at the housing is necessarily one-dimensional in nature. Now, you got a chapter called housing. Guess what you're going to read about? You're going to read about I'm not going to read about farm fresh or something like that. When you look at housing in the context of the community, that's where my that's where my busyness, uh, I guess I should, could say, uh, we don't believe that this chapter page upon page of notes to show that, plus I'm in the midst of analyzing a lot of these free people have a discussion about housing. You attached uh, trailers, what have you, but when you're looking at the the whole of the community. The sense I've got from a lot of this discussion and reading these surveys, sort of like this. Um, 50 pages of commentary. A man shows up over and Please help us preserve what we have. So, if you step back from the goes, uh, it's a terms of what we're supposed to do. For it falls short. The um, to a higher level of thought from what I just said. That just housing. Do we have enough housing? Set some sort of uh, objective growth rate of X over a certain period of time. Even the document is inconsistent internally when it addresses that issue. At the very end, it makes an explicit record. Some of the discussion that's been here, almost built out. It talks to environmental constraints. And, and if you put a gun to my head and say, successful, like, like for housing, and because we have a discussion about saying something that's crystal clear. This is all the different points of view. It says what we want to achieve with housing. Then with the framework, all these other things fit. Uh, that, that's my thought now. I hope it's understandable and to the extent that it's not in train with the uh, census view. I apologize, but. Uh... Okay, thank you, John. Can I, can I also add to what John is, yes, and I think he and I are sort of getting at the same problem from a from a from different. Angle. 
schools. Um, if we are to build a livable city, then obviously housing does become part of the mix and the, the Pocosin character that we hear about, the small town feel that we hear about. Um, I think John is speaking to those comments coming through very loud and clear from our citizen surveys. And my question was not a flippant question about what is our goal? Are we really prepared to have 100% build out and become a suburb? If we're going to become a, a residential su suburban um, community, then what's going to differentiate us from, say, a Danby or another area? So I think we need to be somewhat thoughtful in terms of um, how you know, we go about zoning pieces of property that are currently, if we, have, if we are getting close to build out, those remaining pieces of property become even more highly strategic that the planning be done even more thoughtfully going forward. Um, when, I do, when I did the numbers and I added legacy, legacy in 15 years meet, meets our target household projection for the year 2030. That's one development. Um, and so if we're talking about other overlay <laughs> districts, PUDs, um, I would have a concern about that because where, where would we be looking at those, those pieces of property to, to go. So um, I think, John, you, you do, you're making a really good, reasonable argument that I think this body here, we should be looking at the integration of all of these chapters as they affect one another rather than just going, looking at them myopically and saying, you know, this is a good mix. I'm very, very supportive of, of a, a diverse housing um, stock and allowing uh, different configurations. But at the same time, I'm real concerned if we are going headstrong into a 100% build out. I think, I think that would be the, the devastation of the character of our, of our town, quite frankly, and will become just another suburb. Again, I haven't been here for less than you. Where's the dri driving force been behind the 100% build out? Is any, are we saying that? Are we saying that we want 100% build out? I mean, maybe we are. I don't know. I didn't think we were. So, for me, where it's where already been 100%. Where that comes right from. Right here. Is it? Right here. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder where all these people were that wanted to have no growth. John, between 1970 and 1979, if you look on your graft, and 1980 and 1989, I want to know where all of the people were at that time that wanted no change. Not to be ugly, but all of you, most of you sitting here, were my change. My change. I, I was here during that time. Greatest load of people came here during that time. That was, that was my, <laughs> my small town, and it was over after that. It's 100% build out for me right now. So, you know, when we start talking about no change, and also, John, that survey, how many people does, did we say that represented of our town? About a third? 30%. Okay. We, we are a representative government. That survey does not represent every person in this community. So, you know, I, but to hear people come here, and it, it honestly, I'm going to tell you the truth, it makes me mad when I hear somebody come here and say, don't want any change, just want everything to stay just like it is. Well, you know what? I probably would have liked that too, but that's not the way communities evolve. In, six, in the 1600s, when people came here and settled, they probably liked the small town atmosphere too and probably got upset when another boatload showed up, came in, started building houses. But you know what? That's what's made us what we are today, is that change. That's what's made us the nice community to come here. That's why all of the people wanted to come here, because we did have something really nice. Our ancestors created a nice place, and it made it 
it made it attractive. People said, we want to come there. So, you know, what do you do? Just close up and say, you know, well, we're not. And I, I you know, I, that mindset just, it really, let me, let me really is difficult to, it's difficult. Now, now wait a minute. I'm, I'm not finished. Just a second. Now, what y'all are talking about here is a very detailed, you want to go into a very detailed explanation of housing, which to me is not what we are supposed to be doing here. Now, maybe I'm wrong. But I feel like it's not. This is not the place for it. Now, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm really struggling to, to deal with your comments. I'm struggling to deal with them. I really am. <laughs> last, last meeting, uh, last work session, I really tried very hard to see where you're coming from. And we've tried, I've tried to say in a nice way what, what we are trying to do. Uh, I'm not trying to totally stop growth in this community. I'm not, try I'm not trying to totally have 100% build out. I'm not trying to do either one. But I am trying to look at this in a way that we, we have, have a document here that does deal, not in minute detail, because I don't think that's what this is supposed to do. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I do not agree with you on what you're saying. That doesn't mean your, you know, points aren't taken well, but I, I just think it's something that maybe you're not getting, you know, getting the whole thing here. I, I don't know. And Lee, I understand, you know, your point of view and you agree with him, but I, I don't. I don't agree with either one of you that that is what we're doing here. So the, may I respond now? Certainly. So the, I'm not sure what it is that I said. They say there, there should be no growth. We're in agreement with the people that their comments. You said you were you okay. were in full agreement with that, and that's fine. Oh, yours is. But they don't represent the whole community either. Said that whatever. John, let's, let's stop right there. This conversation is not warranted here. You and I can discuss this. This is a work session, and, and it has nothing to do with how I feel personally about you or how you personally feel about me. This is about a work session to update this comprehensive plan, and I think it got out last time at the work session, got out of hand, but and we're not going to do that this time. You, so. can't, you can't have it both ways. You sat there and told me I made you angry. No, sir. Yeah. No. Yes, you did. I said your comment about no change, and that, in, that was not specifically directed at you personally. I said I, it does make me mad when I hear people say that, and it does, because it's not reasonable and it's not logical. It's in the course of events, it's not. Because if you have no change, John, in anything, it, it, it does, it, it's just life, part of life. Life changes, nothing you I said, change, I nothing change. Nothing I said suggested that I'm opposed to change. Look, the chapter on housing, Jerry picked a couple comments out of questionnaires and made a, made a statement to the effect that there was strong support for small uh, housing. The fact of the matter is, in the, he's quoted 55%. That's moderate support. I'll grant you that. Later in the same paragraph, he talks about 4% of the people being strongly opposed to zoning change. So I read that as a old but still thoughtful person, I hope, okay, uh, and I'm saying, when this is all said and done, we have pages of paper that says 
there's an assumption, there's an implicit assumption in the authorship of this chapter that this community is going to get full bore behind building more houses. And all I'm saying is that what are our goals for housing? Is it, is it to go full bore? Is it to have some medium approach? Is it to do none? I don't really care what it is. But I'm a, I'm a guy that tries to envision the concept of the big picture before I start working on the details. This chapter works on the details. So here's the question. How does this group defend basically not paying attention to the survey? We very picked and we may pay attention to two statistics. 55% want this modest out. Pages and pages of other stuff that, that expresses other views. And while I'm on it, about this survey, I think it's a real slap in the face against the city and this group that did this survey didn't devote any resources uh, paid for or organized up front to do the analysis. Look up team right now. Nobody seems to care about it. So, uh, if we're about putting a X in the block to get through the chapter, I'm all for it. I'm not taking a look at the big picture. I'm just this does not. This, this, as we have said, does not say that we're going to do any certain types of development. It does not say that. Well, it says what it says is that we are, we are open to certain things, but we're not, we're not putting a definite plan in. It, it's not a definite thing. It, it is saying that we are open to options that may be possibilities. And that's, that's what this says. So, if I may, my interpretation, it does not speak to the tempo of housing growth. It simply speaks that when housing does inevitably grow, that in the view of this document, it should grow in the direction of medium density in some very few cases, maybe even high density, lower income, housing diverse ways. Is, am I interpreting that correctly? We are not speaking to the tempo of construction, the tempo of build out. The te We're not trying to accelerate that in any way with this document. Well, if, if I may, I think it's even even more than that. I, I think it speaks to if someone comes to the city with a proposal to build something like that, that if if this is approved, and it gives us a framework from which we should be working. But I think we also have to rec recognize you know, some of these conversations. I don't know the numbers, so I'm going to be just out there. But an awful lot of this city is zoned residential. And I can, I know where I live in the West today, there's lots of chunks of land where people are putting things up. They don't come before the city council. They don't come before the planning commission. If, if you own eight acres of residential property and you want to put up eight houses on one acre's property, you got to meet the codes, sidewalks and sewage and all that sort of stuff is concerned. But you don't, there's no approval. We have absolutely no control over that. When I say we, I'm talking about the city. People own it. And if it's zoned that way, now they come here to change a zoning request, then we get to talk about it. Uh, so, you know, if we get another fountains of Pocosin, if we get another first lane townhouses or something like that, we have a framework to look at. But some of these things, you know, I don't know how we can stop it. I think it's, you know, I, I, if we really wanted to with zoning. But. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah but, but, but to go back and right. rezone something that somebody owns, you're going to wind up in court. Right. And right. I, I, think, I don't think that's really worth it. Again, if Joan it's against it, we'll. Right. Yeah. Seems like all we can do is just basically paint a picture of what we believe, the way we'd like to preserve the, the way this town clicks. And, you know, that's all we're saying. We're just saying, you know, we know we can't stop everything, but we'd like to keep the mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the town, whatever chance, that may be. When we get a chance to comment on something, we need to take these things into consideration. Right. That's the way I read it. If we get a chance to comment, because I don't know if anything else is going to happen or not. And unfortunately, usually what happens is something bad happens and everybody's reactionary. You know, I mean, you know, like, it's a sad fact, but the fact of the matter is, it wasn't until the Walmart was going to come in that people even filled these chairs. 
Nobody even comes to these meetings unless it's something bad always. You know, they don't come to cheer us on or anything. But I mean, I think you're right. I think we, we all like the town. We all want to preserve its small town feel and whatever that takes. If we ever have the choice to say anything, that's all we want to say. If we could kind of skip forward a little bit to the land use section. In the land use section, we're going to be concentrating more. Where does this diverse housing, where is it more appropriately located in the city? And the only bad thing about taking the, the comp plan chapters is that it's a build on, each chapter is a build on to what you ultimately decide for the land use chapter. And in that chapter, of course, like I said, we'll be looking at the various areas where the higher density type of de development is more appropriate based on infrastructure needs, based on wetlands, the preservation of wetlands, um, preservation of conservation or of open. A couple of things I'd like for you to think about, all of, of everyone to, to concentrate on as we're moving forward. We do not have many large tracts of Developed land at this point. Um, they're zoned for residential purposes. If you focus on basically on Yorktown Road, there's a 20 acre track right before you get to Christian Center. No, I'm sorry, it's right after Victory Christian Center. And then there's a track of land on the, I'm trying to think, <laughs> I guess it's on the east side of um, Oak huge track and but it's has a lot of wetlands and so does the other 20 track. so when we're thinking about you know, where we're wanting to put these smaller lots we might want to think about those type of tracks that are located they're undeveloped they have a lot of challenges primarily because of wetlands that those are the kind of tracks that are the most appropriate most likely for a smaller lot size and or a more diverse housing type such as duplexes as opposed to maybe single family or doing a mixture there of both. Um, one other point is that I know that when we went through the, the challenges of the approval of the villas, we're talking about rezonings Rezonings, people always come out in opposition to it, if they're, if, especially if they're an adjacent property owner, because they're concerned about the multifamily stigma. And I know that considering the villas, the council chamber full many nights with people opposed to it. But if you look at that development, it served the city very well, and it provided a housing concept that we had never had, and it provided a housing concept for the elderly, especially our elder wid widows, a place to live where they felt safe. It was a one-story unit. And it, but it, my point is, is that product that had never been introduced to the city, and everyone was afraid to death of it. But it's turned out to be a very quality development. So it's a matter of educating and giving the public an opportunity to understand why you're doing the rezoning or why you're providing for this particular house. And certainly the, the survey should be used and it's being incorporated into the ele these various elements of the comp plan the survey comments should be considered as a part of this process. They should not be excused. And I think that we will try to be very cautious about capturing those comments that we've received and to incorporate them into the comp plan. But a lot of these comments are the same comments that we have received in multiple survey responses. And I constantly hear that there is a need for moderate priced housing. And the only way that you're going to be able to get that kind of a product is to allow for a higher density, 
on smaller lots, and especially in those areas where there's a lot of wet on these tracts of land, so the actual building envelope has already shrunk down substantially. If a developer can't make money, and believe me, I'm not on the side of a developer, but if they can't make money, they're going to walk away from it. So you just have to kind of balance all of that out as we move forward. But I think in the land use chapter, a lot of the comments that are in this evening, I think it will be a really good conversation at that time. Because then you're going to be placing what you've learned through the other preceding chapters, you're going to be placing that into action especially on a land use map, where you're going to be identifying where is the most appropriate areas for this kind of development, for the diversity. And also keep in mind that with the smaller lots, um, I think that the homes that are in our floodplain areas, they're very desirable. But this is what we constantly battle with when we're trying to market the city on just our existing housing products is that people can't afford the flood insurance. So if we have an opportunity, like I pointed out with the two parcels on, on Yorktown Road, those are outside of a floodplain, to capture a younger audience with those properties, I think that we would find that we could generate a younger crowd into the city. That's my two cents worth. Thank <laughs> you, Debbie. Very good. You summed it. The only thing I would say, I wasn't involved in the survey at all, but I could see what John was saying about comments and how we should take advantage of those. And I was seeing what Bonnie was saying about the fact that is the survey necessarily representative of the people and things like that. The question I have is, like, when somebody puts a comment in there, have we set up any mechanisms to then continue the conversation? They put comments. I like it the way it is. Well, it would be nice to know who they are so we can go back and say, okay, what do you suggest are reasons? I mean, if we're representing the public, we need to talk to the public. Do we have any pipelines or any plans to basically follow up in some mechanism? And it's not necessarily up to us to do. We're busy people. But I mean, like uh, uh, town four, I mean, nobody shows up anyway. But my point is, it's nice to continue to mine there. If somebody took the time to fill out the survey, I think they'd be flattered to think that we're going to get back to them again. But again, I didn't take part in that. And I know it's somebody's work for us to do it. But I mean, is there any way in which we can continue to keep that that dialogue is a good thing. I don't, I really don't mean this to sound. I think this is that opportunity, right? Us. Well, well this. Public hearing. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, certainly, I'm, I'm very hopeful that if the conversation, this is, this would be the most appropriate. For the only good, but the problem is this, but they're not here to talk to us. Well, we, were we, going, really we were going to have a discussion tonight after we were going to have like a public comment. We had said we were going to have a public comment. You know, we wanted that, but as you can see, not. If something. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Broadcast. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what mm -hmm. we're Reminds me of the kind of conversation that informally takes place at the coast at the coast of McDonald's every morning between the folks that are sitting there. You know, <laughs> these conversations are happening all over the place, but unfortunately, they're not really involving us. And that, that I'm sure you know what I'm saying is somehow it would be nice to somehow mine that because you're right. It's kind of scary to think we're representing the entire town. For me, it is. No, I don't speak for everybody. I only speak for me. And sometimes I'm going to tell you this. I had a lady come in the office one day, and she commented to me, and she does not know that I'm on planning commission, she made the comment that she hoped that, I think she's, I don't know how she worded it, but more or less um, don't want any, any, you know, businesses, don't, don't want any large businesses, uh, no more development. So I, I calmly looked at her, and I just said, well, let me give you just something to think about your comments. I understand, you know, that's your initial comment. But I said, let me just, you know, mention a couple of things to you. And I did. I presented another side that she never had even thought about. And that's where, I guess that's where, where we sit here, and the longer we stay, we sort of begin to see things, I guess, a little differently. We see them 
from a more, I want to say, I, I'm not using this term in a way that I, I want to say knowledgeable, but you have more access, I guess, to the issues and the things that are facing the city. And it gives you a little different perspective. And I find that has happened to me. I've evolved with that, and I have changed. Because I used to sort of be, you know, the comments that I read were comments that probably I have made in the past. When I didn't want to see any growth, no change. So, you know, I identify with that. But as I begin to, to serve in this capacity, I begin to see things a little differently. When I first came on, I was very, very much like, you know, a new person, and I was interested in learning, and I would often just listen and learn that. I didn't have all, I didn't have all the answers then. I don't have them all then, now. But you begin to see things from a little different perspective, I guess perspective from all aspects of the community. And it, it's, as I say, it's not easy. But what we have here is, I good. I, I don't take back my comments that I think what we have here is very good, and I like it. it. It actually meets what we need. I like it, so I'm gonna stand with that. And that some of you have differences with me, that does not make me not like you. Just because I have a difference with you, I can disagree with you, and I can still like you and, and respect your thoughts. I do, but I come from, you know, what I feel, so I have to say that. I can't, you know, I can't not say that. Okay, do we have anything else? I think we've had enough on. You get in two weeks. All right. I think we'll be ready to tackle the economics next time, and that's September 21st. Hope we have everybody here because it's really been very good tonight to hear the different. It'll be an interesting discussion. Very good. Yes, it economics certainly will. And are going to be interesting. Very different. Very when, when do you expect that uh, chapter's going to be ready for review? Because I, I appreciated the fact we had the time to read this and study it which I did. I'd like to do it for the next one. I'm hoping to have a draft ready by next Friday, if not the beginning of the week of the 21st. And when's the meeting? Monday. When's the meeting? Two weeks from tonight. 21st. 21st. Uh -huh, September 21st. And I want to apologize for not having read it yet. I feel like I'm not doing part of my job. I apologize. I've just been buying a lot of different things. Thank you for your efforts. And I apologize. Right. It's kind of insulting in my eyes for me not to read it. Time to write it, read it, so I'm sorry. You do not owe us any apologies. No, You've got you'll, a lot going on in yes, your life. Yes, you have. We appreciate the yeah. trip this evening. I appreciate your understanding. Irma away. Pardon me? Keep Irma away. Yeah, I'm going to try. You've got a job. <laughs> I know. It's a job to do. Yeah, we'll learn about wetlands really quick. Keep the wind down. All right, thank <laughs> all of you for coming tonight.